The Apollo Hospital was the only private hospital which was allowed to admit and treat COVID patients by the okay. government. At that time, my wife asked uh, the in, in, uh, the ID specialist who was taking care of me. So what 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 next? So mm. he t- he tells her just pray. Family, love, uh, holiday, fun, and no work. <laughs> okay. Hello everyone, welcome to our podcast today. We are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Ravi Andrews, who is a nephrologist practicing at Apollo Jubilee Hills in Hyderabad. So, hi doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. A uh, little background about yourself if you can, for the viewers who are not aware about you. Thank you very much, Fuju, for having me on the show. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so I am a nephrologist. I'm, that's basically kidney specialist yes. for the uninitiated. And uh, I have been working at Apollo Hospital for the last 20 years, from oh. 2000, 2001 onwards. And uh, well, I practice nephrology and I think as uh, this podcast goes on, we'll have more information about uh, yes, what exactly I do, how I do it, when I do it and where I do it. Definitely. So let's start with understanding the young Ravi Andrews, maybe 20, 25 years back in time. Uh, what exactly enticed you to move towards the medical field? Well, we'll talk first about the young Ravi Andrews. That's very, very, very long ago. <laughs> I was born and brought up in Mumbai. Yeah. Uh, typical Mumbai public school product. And uh, uh, we used to stay uh, in a place called Kulaba. At that point of time, till the age of uh, 15, I don't think I did anything significant in my life. The only significant thing I did was probably pick up the guitar at the age of 15. And uh, at that age, you know, people pick up uh, guitar for one and only one reason to score chicks. <laughs> at that point in time, the only thing that could help you score a chick would be either you have uh, a motorbike or uh, a guitar. So it was much easier to get the guitar. <laughs> so I started that off. Then uh, medicine happened. Now, after medicine happened, I had to give up uh, guitaring at least for some uh, point in time. And there was a point in time where I wanted to professionally go into music, but then medicine happened and that didn't happen. Now, why did medicine happen? Yes. I can be very politically correct here and say, uh, at a young age, I wanted to help people. I wanted to do good. (laughs) I wanted to change the world. You know, at that young age, yes, you do want to do things, but you don't want to do it through a medicine perspective. You either want to be a revolutionary or you want to go into sports or you want to do something special from, or be a writer or make a film or something and then do something special to change the world then. But uh, for, and uh, I'm not going to say that I wanted to do medicine to change the world because I was a good person at heart and I wanted to do good things. The reason I did medicine was because I didn't want to do engineering. Okay. And the reason I didn't want to do engineering, we'll just go back into time. See, we're talking about the 80s. Yes. At that time, you were not even born. <laughs> Probably your parents also hadn't met each other. So uh, at that time, after 10th, you had only three choices. You do either arts, commerce or medis- or science. Okay. If you do science, you have only two choices, engineering or medicine. That's it. No other choices. Mm-hmm. My father happened to be an engineer. Okay. And uh, initially, he was, uh, I was not very good at math and physics, so he would uh, teach me. Later on, I got good at math and physics. I got so much good at it that I was better at it than chemistry and biology. But my father, God bless his soul, he's not here with us, but he was a very bad teacher. And I knew that if I got into (laughs) engineering, he's going to teach me the engineering subjects and he's going to make my life hell. So the okay. only reason I got into medicine was because I didn't want to do engineering. And that's what happened. I got into medicine. But were you so averse that you were able to crack the medical exam just to stay away <laughs> from his teaching? Well, I guess I was uh, reasonably good at studies. Okay. And uh, uh, maths and physics were, though, my, though they were my strong subjects. But chemistry and biology wasn't too hard either. So I luckily I managed, luck and a little bit of effort as well, I managed to crack the exams and got in. And then you did your medicine from where? I studied in CMC Vellore. I think some okay. people would know about it. It's a pretty good institute. Uh, finished off the MBBS there. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, by the time I finished MBBS, all of us realized that MBBS was not enough and you had to do something uh, post-graduation, either uh, medicine or surgery or obstetric gynecology or pediatrics. So then I went on and did uh, internal medicine. I did that in Mumbai in Hinduja Hospital. Okay. By the time I finished internal medicine and became a physician, we all realized that that's not enough. You need to do a sub-specialization. Yes. So either in cardiology, nephrology, pulmonology, neurology, something. 
and ironically most people who get into medicine get into medicine to escape physics and maths yes and i got into nephrology which has got a lot of physics and maths in it physics and maths yes it's lot of calculations and uh, yeah. it's always 2 plus 2 equals 4 in nephrology it is as mathematical a branch of medicine as you can get i didn't know kidney involves numbers <laughs> in fact uh, thing okay i'll be a little technical here yes please so things like uh, the creatinine the sodium the potassium these are all numbers there are numbers uh, attached to it and we can look at those numbers as an nephrologist we can take interventions make interventions so say for example the sodium is high you can give some treatment to reduce the sodium you can calculate how much treatment you want to give you have to calculate okay. the treatment you want to give and you make those calculations and you can predict that tomorrow the value is going to be this if i do this kind of calculation and give this kind of treatment yeah. and that applies to almost all the chemicals in the body the main ones like sodium potassium which is the common electrolytes yeah. you can make the calculations and you can predict what it's going to be tomorrow and that's oh. what makes it so mathematical even something like dialysis simple process yeah that also you can predict ki at this time if i start dialysis and i do so many hours of dialysis i can approximately get the creatinine or the urea which are the toxins to this particular level and sure enough lo and behold the next day when you come and do the testing and check be, it's likely to be closer to the level that you expect it, it to be but so that's very that's like an advantage right you you know what is happening even when you're not physically present then yes so i'm a nephrologist right so i'm going to be veering towards nephrology i'll have a bias towards it it's like i said the most mathematical branch in medicine that's for sure second it encompasses all kinds of treatment like for example if you have a kidney problem you can diagnose it by doing by doing a basic test called a creatinine yes this simple you do a creatinine it's elevated you know you have kidney problem yes for uh, another if you look at another branch of medicine say somebody's got chest pain chest pain could be anything from the bone from the muscle from the heart from the gi tract so some acidity it could be something from the nerves so you're not sure what it is too many switches to tap on to exactly you put that really nicely yes. so whereas for a kidney thing you do a creatinine you're clear this is yes. a kidney problem then you next step why is the kidney problem you do a kidney biopsy you get the answer okay luckily you have two kidneys so even if you poke one and something happens to it the other one is there to take care of it yes. all the other organs and most of the other organs in the body are not paired organs so you don't you're a little scared to poke them and get a biopsy yes. to get a tissue diagnosis so you get a diagnosis with the biopsy once you get the diagnosis you have a treatment you either do dialysis which can keep a person going for quite some years or you do a kidney transplant and they're done and dusted the uh, game over game basically done basically two step process for you but a lot of math yes a lot of math yeah so you like you said after your uh, what do you call your stint at bombay hospital in yes. doja after that why did you choose nephrology and not something else uh during your medicine posting you are you rotate through all the sub specialties so you spend 3 4 months in rheumatology 3 4 months in neurology cardiology and at the end of it all you put it all together and you decide which one you're going to do a sub specialization in okay so for me my last for me every posting that i went through and this is a tribute to the teachers that i had every posting that i went through so I went through cardiology i wanted to do cardiology at the end of it i went through neurology i wanted to do neurology at the end of it i went to gastro i wanted to do gastro at the end of it my last posting happened to be nephrology okay and uh, i really enjoyed it and my boss the his name is dr bharat shah he's still practicing in mumbai so initially i was a little skeptical i said nephrology it's also mathematical there's nothing clinical here then he said work with me ravi work with me for four months three months at the end of three months i was sold that was it i decided i was going to do nephrology because one it's so mathematical so clinical and you can from a to z diagnosis confirmation of diagnosis treatment transplant it's there all along is the is it's there yeah. it's not there in many other branches like for cardiac disease cardiac There's transplant multiple is so, ways to go about everything yes, and the final result or final answer would be a transplant it's so rare it's so difficult to do same mm. with lung transplant kidney transplants are so easy and so simple in fact uh, one of the great nephrologists in our country once said kidney transplant is so easy you can do it under a tree if you want to <laughs> so how many transplants have you successfully done so far 
So uh, I to keep a track. I haven't been keeping a track, but uh, you know, I can say on an average, uh, I do probably two a month. Okay. So we're talking about fifteen uh, years. So you can do the math. I'm a nephrologist. <laughs> I don't do math. <laughs> Okay so you put down the guitar when you were going to go to college and then when did you pick it up again so medical college gives you a little bit of opportunity to explore other talents because it's not just about those uh, at least the place where i trained uh, those five and a half years it's not like uh, you're totally under a bushel and you're just sitting and mugging and mugging and mugging and not doing anything else they give you a lot of opportunity to explore other things to try out your talent so but do they give you enough time for it you have to create the time everybody has the same 24 hours what you do with those 24 hours is your business True. so uh, we somehow did manage and there were like minded people so we could all get together and somehow managed to find time so i, I explored uh, music i explored a little bit of acting those kind of things but that also helped uh, you uh, to switch off otherwise you know just sitting and mugging yeah. mugging mugging keeping your mind there tunnel vision doesn't really help so yeah i got an opportunity to explore uh, musical talents there uh, we have uh these house competitions interclass competitions all these things so we would take part in them so did you hit the ground running or was it like building yourself back up again with the guitar no i didn't hit the ground running i hit the ground <laughs> crawling <laughs> because uh, like uh, there's this brian adams song you know played the guitar till my uh, summer of 69 yeah, i yeah, played yeah, the guitar till my fingers bled yeah. and that's exactly what happened <laughs> over there i went there and then uh, we had to do blood testing for ourselves <laughs> yeah in the uh, first year physiology yes. so we had to pull our cells with lancets and check our hemoglobin yeah. and we had to do it ourselves so i would do that in the afternoon and then i would go back and play guitar in the evening and then the, my fingers would be bleeding and i would remember <laughs> brian adams yeah you're right <laughs> so yeah it was a uh, little tough to find time i obviously didn't hit the ground running but yeah we got uh, we got together a group of us we managed to Oh, so you guys had a band we didn't have a band per se but then you know when the class got together that would be the okay. class band it was not one particular hosp- hospital or college band okay so when did fitness come into your life when i joined medicine mm-hmm. i was a 37 kilo weakling i What? was 37 kilos when i joined medicine i need to see pictures of this <laughs> you wouldn't be able to see me <laughs> I, was, i was invisible almost so uh, but i was always into sport okay and uh, in cmc vellore well, we have got a huge campus so there's there's a tennis court there's a badminton court basketball volleyball cricket ground everything so and we had table tennis tables everything we had all the opportunities to play so i used to play a lot of sport okay and uh, then of course the we also had a gym attached it was a very we're talking about you know 1980s yeah mid 80s colored very dumbbells rooting, metal ones not even colored they were just metal rusted. iron rusted and uh, there would be these roman rings yeah uh, it had always been my thing to do a crucifix by by dream <laughs> i couldn't do it but anyway the rings were there and then there were these parallel bars the steel parallel bars a few little weights and also that that gym was just attached to the hostel okay so 80 37 kilo weakling so you know yeah. everybody would kick me around so i said i need to build up some muscle so i joined the gym in addition to the Play games sports. that i was playing i was 58 kilos by the time i left So, so was there anyone to guide you? No, it was all the seniors who would guide us. Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so after that, uh, I stopped gym after that. After I left uh, okay. medical college, then I got into sport. I huh? overdid the sport, damaged my uh, ligaments, my knees, and my back, and all that. So then I had to finally give up sport. That's when I came back to gym. So okay. that was in two thousand. So you stepped into gym because you couldn't play sport, or you stepped into gym to rehab yourself? No, I stepped into gym because I couldn't play sport. I wasn't okay. that bad that I needed rehab. So, but I needed uh, to keep myself fit and I couldn't do it because I couldn't play. So the only other option was back to gym. And that was in which year? 20 2000. 2000. Yeah. And then 21 years ago. You would have been how how old then? You would have been 5 or 6. You would I have been in your probably almost six, in your nappies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was pretty much averse to gyms and stuff back then when I was a kid. So how much of your medical knowledge were you able to use into fitness early on you know that makes a big difference and i'm glad you brought that up because generally otherwise people who go to the gym they're completely nuvo they really don't know anything what to do how to do how much to do and they're often guided by trainers 
who been trained maybe who have themselves have been trained only for 6 months or so or maybe sometimes even 6 weeks what advantage we have as medicos is we understand anatomy so you know which muscle acts at which place and how you can isolate that particular muscle because workout is about isolating a particular muscle and a joint you don't want to yes. use multiple muscles to move a particular joint uh-huh. so then you if you know some basic anatomy you can understand basically there's better uh, micro management yes and your movements and your muscle action that you use you can minimize it to have maximum effect with minimal impact so but also at the same time being a medico i think you must have had more better knowledge when it came to how to fuel the body in order to get the optimum results along with the anatomy knowledge right so how much of it were you able to derive from your medical college and then apply it in the gym now as far as fueling is concerned i think we need to make it simple i'm not a big advocate of uh, using this protein shakes and all in fact uh, come to the gym and half the half the time half the boys are doing this 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 <laughs> this, this, this this so you know i'm not really uh, in fact i'm going to strongly recommend against it in yeah. our talk later on so using protein shakes using food supplements protein supplements to refuel your body is not good it's not the right thing to do unless you want to become like arnold schwarzenegger or you know one of those uh, mr universe mr india types in that situation you have to be ready to give up on your health your overall health health is not about looking good and being fit people consume uh, get confused between health and aesthetics yes so that's not what you should be looking for so if you are at that level then you are going to definitely damage your body in some way or the other so for normal people like us just need to ensure that you eat enough protein eat enough carbs lot of people cut down on carbs saying yes. that you know i want to build up muscles so i'm going to go, go on high protein keto diet zero carb diet no that's not good carb is your fuel actually exactly it's not really protein so you must take enough carbs enough protein keep it simple if you're a vegetarian eat as much veg protein as you possibly can if you're non vegetarian eat as much as your stomach allows you to eat it's not like you know you should eat two three tandoori chickens and you know just build up your protein yeah. levels that way so keep it simple eat a normal maybe slightly higher protein diet than normal people ensure you take enough carbs and most importantly ensure that you take enough liquids because that's a major mistake people do exactly. they don't take I was enough going to come to that so there's this water cycle that happens in our body right yes so can you enlighten our viewers about that yeah so again simplify it you drink a certain amount of water that is metabolized and the kidney will remove it now drinking a lot of people have this misconception that if you drink a lot of water the kidneys will remove it and more toxins will come, come out. out that's not true because there is a fixed amount of toxin in your body and the kidney can remove only so much toxin drink making it make uh, drinking more water and making your kidneys work over time in an attempt to remove extra toxins is not going to work is counterproductive So what happens if you drink too much water? One, all the electrolytes in your body get diluted, and the most worrying and the dangerous electrolyte is sodium. If the sodium gets diluted, your sodium levels drop. You can even die. Starts off with weakness, giddiness, tiredness. You have those warning signs. Then you start getting confused. Then you go into coma, and then you can die. Recently, there's been an article about Bruce Lee, uh, that famous kung fu guy. Yeah. And. Uh, nobody he died at the age of 33 i think and nobody no, really i think 37 yeah uh, yeah you you not, not very sure but yeah somewhere, somewhere in the 30s somewhere in 30s yeah so uh, no there were a lot of uh, theories conspiracy theories about how he died he was poisoned he was this he was that but uh, some medical people got together a nephrologist amongst them and they felt looking at all this symptomatology that he probably had very low sodium levels in his uh, part of his jeet kune de kuno kune do That's yeah. the thing he, the kung fu thing he started. So in that uh, he advocates drinking drinking a lot of water. So he used to drink a lot of water, and obviously his sodium levels would have dropped, and that's what probably caused the brain swelling. He died of cerebral yes. edema, and uh, that causes death. So drinking too much water, definitely not. And drinking too less, also not. So the next question is going to be how much uh, should yes. people drink? It's two to three liters per day, and your body yeah. will tell you how much you need. Yes, but generally two to three liters but per day. But for a very active individual, you can add a liter. A liter, you can add a liter, liter but half, not right? ten, five, oh. eight liters, which people do. Yes, that's not at all good for you. It's overloading your kidneys and it's diluting all the sodium. But apart from water, sodium. what other things would you recommend for people to use for hydration in in cases where there's a sodium crash? Yes, or there's a potassium crash. Now, how to manage that at home? 
these things for you you can't really manage at home unless you have some blood test to tell you what it is yes. you cannot make a clinical diagnosis of low sodium but or I low feel, potassium uh, the sodium crash the first uh, flash warning is probably cramps and dehydration right yes so how do you how do you make people manage that yes it's simple no i mean if you are uh, cramping or dehydrating drink more water and but then I, i have i know personally I, so many more hmm. people who are averse to drinking water no <laughs> see we can recommend what you do is your business but the recommendation is if you're cramping and you feel you're not your body is rehydrated drink more fluids and preferably drink fluid with a little bit of salt in it but again don't overdo that yeah. don't take stuff like electrol and ors and all those kind of things gatorade maybe i'm not uh, officially you know promoting, them. promoting gatorade but uh, yeah that's probably the, the best combination is to take a good amount of electrolytes basically. yes Yes. and your body will will tell you like you said if you're cramping it will tell you that there's something going on and you need to stop i think the yeah. more important thing is to stop exercise then rather yeah. than you know trying to replenish and then getting back exactly. to exercise stop right there if your your body will tell you if you're nauseated or you're having some chest pain or you're feeling giddy Sometimes or you're cramping or a headache right it's you yeah. have a headache as well so anything new which happen which is happening while you're working out stop workout immediately and then you know sort out the rest of the thing Yes. So, what do you feel about kids these days abusing creatine? You know, now we are getting three, three to four different types of creatine in the market. There's yeah. monohydrate, there's nitrate. So, I personally feel it is a decent enough supplement as long as you know everything has a place. Doesn't mean you abuse it. But yes. for the kids who are like going crazy about it, and I'm planning to take because in the fitness industry, creatine is one of the most researched upon supplement. Yes. So. What advice would you give the young kids who are acting obsessed about it, or you know, are thinking of taking it, thinking that it will magically transform their body? So maybe you can start with explaining how creatine works in our body. What chain does it take to break down in the body, and what kind of result one can expect? Oh my God, we're getting technical here. <laughs> I'll simplify it, but you gave the answer in the beginning itself. I mean, I want you, you to break it down for the people in a better manner. So no, you you gave the answer in the beginning itself by saying. that you need to get yourself tested before you start these things but we'll come back to that what really creatine does it is a it's a end product of muscle breakdown yes so it's there in the muscle when you work out it uh, breaks down creatine and this has to come out somewhere it comes out through the kidney so as your muscle is breaking down obviously you, and your and it's losing creatinine obviously you want to replace it by by giving creatine creatine is a precursor of creatinine so it starts with creatine broken down to creatinin which is excreted to the kidney so you definitely want to build up the creatine because it's breaking down you can take a supplement now what you've taken the supplement where is it going to go it has to come out through the kidney if you have even a minor kidney dysfunction yes. where it's not allowed uh, able to excrete the amount of creatine that you're taking in mm-hmm. the creatine levels in your body are going to go up in your blood are going to go up if the creatine level goes up in your blood you are going to have weakness giddiness vomiting all the symptoms of kidney failure because the same thing happens in kidney failure in kidney failure the creatine level goes up so the creatine level goes up either due to excessive intake of creatine in excessive breakdown by the muscle or reduced excretion by the kidney any of these three measures or all three together could contribute yeah. to raising the creatine so basically that cycle has to keep moving any yes. one part Block. of it does not work the whole cycle breaks down the cycle breaks down the creatine level goes up and creatine is dangerous because it's a toxin yes it damages the bones it can damage your bone marrow reduce your hemoglobin can cause confusion cause heart problems liver problems can cause your blood pressure to go up so there are a whole lot of problems which happen with elevated creatine so before you start creatine i have no or in general just let them know before you use any supplement it's important to get yourself tested simple little test creatine and we discussed this, alluded this, to this in the beginning itself simple tests will tell you how your kidney is working yeah. creatine there are some other basic tests that we also but like on the whole do. if you just get a kft just done do the kft pictures in front and of if you. that's normal and the other thing is your blood pressure because many a time blood pressure is undetected yes. so you check your if your bp is high also you cannot take these supplements because again the kidney because the seat of blood pressure is the kidney 
Yeah. The kidney is the cause of high blood pressure. Yeah. The heart is the victim of high blood pressure. Yes. And this is one concept I want to straighten right away because everybody believes people confuse it the yes, other way. Yes, they believe heart is either is responsible yes. for high BP. No. Research has shown categorically that the kidney is is responsible for high BP yes. and the heart is a victim. So, if your kidney if you have if you have high BP, you already have so a subclinical what we call subclinical kidney dysfunction which is not overt yeah so a kidney dysfunction doesn't a high creatinine does not necessarily mean that or rather a kidney dysfunction does not necessarily mean that you should have a high creatinine yeah you can have a kidney dysfunction with a normal creatinine but there are the warning signs the warning signs is some problem in the urine or a high blood pressure so bp check creatinine and right. routine urine before you start creatinine if all these are okay please go ahead and take creatinine but again limit it yes Understand. you should know why you're using it basically yes. in the first place you can't just look at others using and be like i want to look like them so i'm just going to copy what they do just jump onto the bandwagon exactly. and just follow the leader yeah. no you blindly you not, be the leader. not even knowing what yeah. creatinine is now another product that is doing well in the market and also has a place for itself as long as it's not abused is l carnitine yes right so what is your take on that and let the viewers know how it actually works in your body and what's the use if it's a toss up if you're telling me head to head between creatinine and l carnitine i would rather go with l carnitine, carnitine because yes. it's more of an antioxidant and it is yes also better for kidney health in fact rather yes. than putting it at risk in fact some patients with kidney dysfunction we give them l yes. carnitine those who are on dialysis get By supplements of l carnitine carnicure carnisure yes carnisure yes carnitor carnisure so uh, between the two definitely i wouldn't mind using l carnitine yes. uh, even just off the cuff without yeah. even doing any kidney function or any other testing because it's a simple thing which is produced anyway in the muscle and then it uh, no harm lot of people take these lot of these multivitamin supplements have got yes. carnitine yes. in it so no harm with it at all but creatinine again i'm emphasizing this point please check your creatinine your urine and your blood pressure before starting it yes just to make them understand like how you explain how creatinine functions and cycles in the body can you just explain them how l carnitine functions in the body l carnitine is basically a, a muscle enzyme not really a muscle enzyme it's more uh, yeah it's a kind of a muscle enzyme yeah uh it's used to improve the muscle contractibility it functions as that but you know there are a lot of other things which also help in muscle contractility yes. for some reason l carnitine because someone uh, has to be the hero right <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's not a double hero it's like yeah, a single, single hero so yeah so l carnitine uh, has been from ages past it's been used it's it's used also in cardiac muscle because the heart also is a muscle remember yeah. so skeletal muscle which is the usual muscle that we have here plus the cardiac muscle and uh, l carnitine got its popularity because of its effectivity in uh, cardiac muscle rehabilitation yes so and that got extrapolated to skeletal muscle so that's which that's also how it works which also in turn led to a higher metabolic rate of sorts you can say marginally but yeah, yeah so which is why it has probably got in the fame that it is getting right now yeah because improves see anything yes. that increases muscle contractility will increase your metabolic rate yeah. so that's that's how it works see but you know at the end of the day there is no shortcut you have to things exercise. that take time are going to take time you can't grow 6 feet tall at the yeah. age of 5 <laughs> everything is going to take time so patients, even at the age of 55 you might not grow 6 feet tall patience so. is probably the biggest supplement they should be marketing and selling right now yes yes patience yeah ab- absolutely yeah. patience for the patients <laughs> yeah So tell us more about the journey that you had post you finished nephrology and straight away joined Apollo yes and I, in fact i trained in apollo itself for okay. the first 3 years and then i just got absorbed into the system so the last 20 years you've been living more at apollo hospital than at your own personal at home, home yes, right yes 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 apollo so, is my first home not my second home. <laughs> so what has been the journey like that with working with them and how you worked up the ladder so uh, you know in a corporate hospital there's no real ladder okay you are it all depends on your qualification you don't at least in the medical uh, part uh, the support services yes you can work yourself yeah. up the work your way up the ladder but otherwise it's very clear cut if you depends on your degree if you are uh, mbbs you are a resident if you are md you are a consultant or a junior consultant and if you are post md you become a super specialist Uh, but you have to have at least three years of experience, work experience. post uh, work experience post your getting your degree. So that's what happened. I got the degree, then three years of experience, and then I got absorbed in the system. So it's not like I had to climb any ladder or anything. I just you just had to walk the path, and uh, you are there where you reach. And in a corporate world, in a private world, not only in medicine, 
ultimately it's your performance that counts yeah. you uh, you performance and also some time because you yourself will need some time to show your performance right you can't yes. show a difference in 6 months exactly so it's all about time you give it enough time like you said patience is what yeah. should be marketed you got to be patient and you do got to do justice to your work and be available i think that's one thing which helped me uh, get where i am is availability yeah being at the right place at the right time not basically. not that right place right time it's being at any place at any time for a patient <laughs> yes that's what yes. it uh, is yes. see because that's what a patient wants a patient wants a doctor who is available for him at any True. time so if you can make yourself put yourself in that position and yeah give that to the patient that's so like the like you. the pocket you know like you want the car keys you reach for it you want the phone you reach for it <laughs> yes. so so you are basically a pocket so. in the pan Okay that's that's a nice <laughs> nice way to describe me yeah Dr <laughs> Ravi Andrews nephrologist pocket in the pant yeah okay <laughs> So I wanted to understand how much has the demograph or the working structure or the medical industry by itself how much has it changed pre and post covid You know nowadays in the olden days it used to be BC AD yeah I think now it's going to be <laughs> like you said it pre covid post covid you know the whole yeah. that whole structure has changed now uh demographically I don't think there's been much change because whatever we were doing pre-COVID, we we're doing the same thing post-COVID, probably with a little bit of uh, more care and circumspection. But otherwise, uh, as far as the medical hierarchy and the structure is concerned, I don't think Fuji has changed. What I'm trying to also understand is the way you deal with patients, not just medically treating them, hmm. but them coming to you with new uh, concerns. given what they what the world in general has faced hmm. their mindset and uh, understanding and approach towards things has completely changed so the way they bring their concerns to you and the kind of concerns also they bring to you has changed so how do you tackle that because me being in the fitness industry i personally face a lot of people come to me with a lot of fears hmm. and dealing with that can get tricky at times yeah see medicine from time immemorial is associated with fear yeah everybody who comes to a medical practitioner comes with fear in their mind with covid i don't think uh, maybe there's an added fear now about covid but yes. uh, i don't think that has changed much they're still scared but yes now they're little more careful about coming to a hospital because they're worried that they might contract the infection uh, one thing covid has done which i should have said earlier one thing covid has done is it has given a major boost to online consultation or telemedicine once upon a time you had to go to the doctor and see him face to face and then you know let yeah. him see you and diagnose but nowadays the facility of online consultation is there and it's taken off in a big big way and uh, it would interest you to know that telemedicine was first started in apollo hospital itself in 2001 what 2001 yes uh, it was but uh, back then i don't think we had video calling right so we had we could we could 2001? do video yeah yeah we could do a video i mean you could have a camera and then you could uh, uh, upload those images or you could do it real time okay through uh, through tv it could it could be done so they started it then itself and they were just there at the right time when covid yeah. started when things got a big boost and the uh, indian medical association permitted uh, telemedicine as a valid uh, method of treatment yeah. so they were already on the band they were the bandwagon actually yeah. they didn't even have to jump on it so they were there that's like it. almost what 20, 20 years 20 of patience years, yes yes So, but of course, that time it didn't take off that well because you know nobody really required it. Most yeah. of the time, if you needed, you would come to the hospital. So that's one thing that COVID did. Telemedicine definitely got a big boost, and uh, now you can sit in the comfort of your house. You can take get a consultation, and you don't need to wait for two hours yes. for the doctor to see you. The doctor will see you within those within that fifteen minute uh, uh, period, yes. and uh, you will get whatever treatment you will get your pres- prescription online. Medicines will be delivered to you online. Investigations will be done at home if you want. So this has happened post covid which is not there. The other thing that covid has done is it's allowed outpatient treatment. Sometimes we need to give antibiotics to patients or other injections. Yes. Earlier days we had to admit them in the hospital yeah. for that. Now this can be done at home because we have home care services. Yeah. So nurses will come home and they will take care of you over there with those and covid has done all that. That kind of for doctors like you that has filtered work now. Yes. You can It actually reduced, yeah. yeah. energy is going your time yeah, is going into the right direct in the proper way the direct yeah. right direction so and yeah but patients now you know you in the covid times you would have these special air filters in the rooms yes. you would have one one glass thing yeah. in front of the doctor between the patient and the doctor so that started at covid time but i think everybody's done away with it now masks 
have uh, come yeah. in in a big way i mean before covid nobody ever wore yeah. masks now every other person is wearing mask even post covid when you when it's not mandatory to wear a mask still people are still continuing it and for example if i have a viral or a cough or cold i would i would wear a mask and go oh. to see a patient which i would do even pre covid and uh, but now more people are following yeah. it even patients and patients attendants are following it basically self policing is happening yeah right there now. is and people are taking more care about uh, their overall health as well because you hear so many things about post covid syndrome exactly which uh, is true but uh, now here i want to stir the on its on its nest a little bit uh, it's become a waste paper basket diagnosis in my opinion so everything which is unexplained now is attributed to covid you had <laughs> covid in 2021 so you have this That's now right. you had covid in 2020 so you have this particular problem now so it's simplifying things a little bit but yes covid has its impact in different ways and it yeah. is had medically non medically uh, economically everything that impact is there so speaking of that uh, a little light on your personal covid story because from what i know it was very bad and yes. you, i want to know how the pre covid ravi andrews was and the <laughs> post covid ravi andrew is yeah unfortunately i don't have my <laughs> pictures about pre covid and post covid but uh, yes i had a bad time during covid now we're talking about covid came into the world in december 2019 and india i think early 2020 feb or march and at that point of time we were still seeing patients and apollo hospital was the only private hospital which was allowed to admit and treat covid patients by the okay. government otherwise all the covid patients had to by force go to gandhi hospital okay. or one of the other uh, government hospital and gandhi was the one which was uh, look which was identified as treating covid for treating covid yeah. but there were corporate patients private patients who wanted to go to private hospital yes. so apollo was the only hospital which was allowed to treat covid patients yeah. so we continued to work through the covid time we were going there and seeing patients many a time patients come with covid but you don't know no. because you've not tested it the testing turnaround was 24 hours so the patient comes today you do the test and the next day you know that they have covid yeah. in the meantime you've already seen them and you've been exposed to them so this happened to me I was exposed to quite a lot of covid patients without even realizing it. We took all the precautions the mask and all the drama dressing and everything you know all the ward dress everything we wore but still a virus is a virus it's going to come in somehow or the other. So I got it. This was in uh, end of June. 2020 uh, June. 20 June 2020 and at that time nobody knew anything about covid. Yeah. Nobody knew how to treat it. Just so, just like brace yourself for the impact and let the tide and go. Yeah, just hope that you are one of the few who survive it. so and there was no specific treatment so i got sick i tried to manage at home for a week i stayed at home suffering fever cough cold isolating myself from the rest of the family but after one week i started getting breathless i yeah i started getting chest pain and breathlessness so i knew the i knew that i couldn't the stay the breathlessness away. was when you were rested or when you were moving around I, just re- even at rest i would feel breathless i, ch- I was checking my saturation it was it started dropping after one week of the illness and even at rest i could not sleep i couldn't lie down i would be breathless i would be coughing so i said no enough was enough i need to get to the hospital so set off and you know because this is uncharted territory then i yes. didn't know that i was going to make it because yeah. there were so many horror stories of people dying of covid yes. so i went to all the rooms in my house just had a look at it and said am i ever going to come back here again okay. it was you know i was in that mode then yeah. while i was uh, i was being taken to the hospital i just looked back and you know my whole family standing at the window looking out i mean it was a surreal moment it was like crazy so went reached the hospital over there i was so my saturation level was some 70 or 80 at home it was 92 to 93 so you know these pulse that, oximeters which yeah. they use the market they're not really that good or yeah. accurate so it was 70 80 by the time i reached the hospital immediately put on oxygen high flow oxygen and uh, at that time my wife asked uh, the in, in, uh, the id specialist who was taking care of me so what 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 next so mm. he, uh, he tells her just pray that was it so she didn't tell me what he told her but then you know uh, it just impacted her really badly and i knew i was really sick because uh, i'm usually so fit i never ever have any problem breathing difficulty just lying down and not mm. able to take a breath have been going to the bathroom was a big job because i would get breathless and uh, yeah i thought i was not going to make it that whole night i'm lying on my back and the lights i'm not able to sleep lights in front of my eyes 
you know uh, when you're driving some is when sometimes after a party and all you're a little lost and you lie down in the back of the car somebody else is driving and you see the street lights going past you and you're all dizzy and you just don't know where you are what's happening that's yeah. the feeling i was having okay and uh, i had near death experience uh, i've been from a medical perspective i've been very curious about these near death experiences there yes. are situations where you know pers- a patient uh, nearly dies and we pull him out of uh, yes. it and then i've always asked them what did you feel what did you see what happened when you were almost when they get better when you're almost yeah. in near death and they universally say that they are going towards a light they're in a tunnel mm-hmm. and they're going towards a light and they're trying to reach out for it they're trying to reach that light and then suddenly they're pulled back they pull back and they open their eyes and they're here okay you know i've asked at least three or four patients there and they've said that i didn't have that kind of a near death experience but what happened was i'm lying down on my stomach because you're supposed to prone for uh, better breathing and uh, i couldn't breathe properly and suddenly uh, one one bull like creature gets off my back and uh, this canters off and you know what kind of bull that bull you have in these uh uh villages not the villages in these uh, parks and all amusement parks no yeah that rodeo bull you yeah. suppose uh, yeah. get onto it and stay on it for some time yeah, yeah. so that kind of bull suddenly get off got so got gets off my chest and bum and uh, you know canters off and then suddenly i can breathe properly okay that's my covid bull i got rid of the covid bull i mean it was a weird experience and always have been on the other side of the table yes this time i was on this side of the table and i could really experience what a patient felt like yeah so Anyway, so the the bull got got off and me. And you were at the hospital for how many days? I was in the hospital for a week. For a week. And the worst part was the second day after I was just getting better, and then my wife gets admitted because she also got COVID. Oh no! At that time, uh, the only person who was at home was my daughter. She is. Uh, she was writing a tenth standard exam. It was right the tenth standard exam. Okay. So the first question I ask her is, "What about uh, Nakshatra? What's she going to do at home? She's all alone, and you're here." Uh, both of us were in the hospital for Who a week. Who was taking care of her then? She was just she managed on her own. Yeah, we had a, a maid who we gave her an option: either you go home or you stay, and or us. you stay for next uh, one week till we come back. And she's very nice of her, so she stayed back and uh, she took care of her. But yeah, so that was that oh. was the more crazy and scary experience was our daughter all alone <laughs> at home and we COVID lying down here. So that was uh, maybe scary. that was one thing that kept you going, saying that you need to go back home for her. I right from the beginning, you know, that thing was there, that positive attitude was there. Like I have to get back, I have to get back. I can't let this little virus beat me. Yeah, you know, that was there. I mean, I I never ever gave up, but there were certain times when I really felt like this is not in my control. What am I going to do? So that COVID experience uh, it changed me. Uh, it made me a little more understanding of other people suffering though as a medico you're supposed to empathize yes. and understand that and feel for them yes but somewhere along the way uh, it slowly gets diluted because you see Obviously. so many people suffering after some time exactly. it looks very similar so uh, yes i i learned more empathy i learned uh, the value of little things in life yes otherwise you take things for granted i have learned the value of family and close friends because i know this sounds unscientific but I think the only reason I survived was because of the good wishes of all the people that I had treated and who I had taken care of and who wanted me yes. to get well. I think that's the reason, sole reason. It's not medicine. It's not luck. It's nothing. It's just good wishes. And I think that's what our focus should be: be the best possible person that you can be, the best possible version of yourself that you can be. Yeah. And uh, everything will fall into place. So, how much about uh, your perspective when? um you know you send off patients now home after treating them from a very bad phase yes compared to before you got covid and now how much that that has changed the kind of emotion and feeling that you let go of that patient to go back home how much has that changed now i'll answer this question in a different way yeah. i've always been asked uh, what is the most satisfying moment as a as a doctor and 99% patient person doctors will tell you a really critically ill patient was admitted he was sick he was dying we did whatever we could do we treated him we saved him and he walked out of the hospital thanking us yes that is real job satisfaction 99% doctors will tell you this 
I'm going to differ a little bit there. And I learned this after 15 years of practice of medicine. I did not learn this in the beginning. In the beginning, for the first five to ten years, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, patient comes very sick, almost dying. You treat them, you get they, they respond to your treatment, they get better, they walk out, they say thank you, and they walk out, and they come back after two months, you're OPD, and you feel so happy. You feel so yes. satisfied. Over the years, I realized there's the two aspects to satisfaction. Personal satisfaction and professional satisfaction. True. When a patient gets well, and goes away, gets better, comes back again for follow-up, you definitely get a personal satisfaction. You also get a professional satisfaction. And many a time we mix these two up. Yeah. For me, the real professional satisfaction is, patient comes really sick, you do all the best, you do the very best that you can do, and the patient dies. And then the family tells you, thank you very much for all that you've done. You've done the best that you could do, and I know he didn't make it, or she didn't make it, but thank you for all the efforts that you put. That is professional satisfaction. Because nowadays, it's always blame the doctor, right? If yes. something goes wrong, the doctor gave a wrong medicine, the hospital didn't treat properly, the nurses didn't take care properly. It's always the blame game. But when things don't go well, and then they appreciate it, that is professional satisfaction. And that's what I have learned now. Now, there are two aspects to satisfaction. Job satisfaction, personal, if they get well, obviously anybody would be happy. Yes. And you're really happy. And professional satisfaction, they don't get well, they don't make it, and still people appreciate all the effort that you put. Thanks. So post-COVID, I think I don't think much has changed there. Still this personal satisfaction and professional satisfaction still remain the same. But now in cases where the patient doesn't make it, yes. now is there a particular manner you break the news? or What exactly happens behind that closed door? Uh, it's something, uh, Fuju, you have to decide case by case. You cannot use the same formula to everybody. But every aspect counts. Eye contact, your body language, what you say. Because if what you say is at variance with your body language or your eye contact, it's meaningless. Yeah. And people are not stupid. They would understand where you're coming from. They'll understand whether you really mean what you say. So you got to, to make that happen, you got to really feel it. Yeah. The only way you can really feel it is if you put yourself in the shoes of the family. Yeah. If you put yourself as a family member and you think, if this was my my person, how would I deal with it? How would I be feeling? So you have to put yourself in that place and you've got to tell them. And but how break can the news. you still be so, by putting yourself, you're kind of building an attachment, right? Yes. How can you still be so emotionally attached to it and still do the hard job of breaking the news? If you're emotionally attached, it's easier to break the news. If you're not attached, Okay, I mean, let's put it this way. It's easier to break the news if you're not emotionally attached. But to, if you want to break the news the right way, you need to be emotionally attached. And uh, I always touch. If I mean, obviously, if I know that that person is not going to be objecting to touch, yeah. but definitely I put hand on shoulder or whatever, rub the back and, and tell them, Ki, there are no more, we've tried our best. This is how it is and uh, make eye contact as far as possible and uh, show that you empathize with them, show that you feel with them. Yeah. And that's the only way out. It's, I don't think the right approach is to just sit there and blindly tell them it's over. I don't think that's the right approach. It's easier for you because uh, you're done and dusted and you're out. But that's not the way I would do it and that's not the way I would tell Each. or expect my juniors to do it. This is what I would tell them to do. Eye contact, look at them, put yourself in their shoes, touch them and tell them. So next segment, we have a really tiny fun mm -hmm. game with you. Okay. So I'm going to say five words mm -hmm. and the first thing that's going to strike your mind, you're going to say that. Okay. Okay. The first word is going to be work. Come on, quick. Workout. Okay. Family. Love. Uh, holiday. Fun. And no work. <laughs> okay. Uh, workout. Oh, part of my life, like breathing. That's nice. What about art or music? You play guitar, so let's just say music. Music? Oh, it's uh, balm for the soul. That's, that's a really nice answer. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on this podcast. 
taking time out from your really busy schedule from your thankless job no, 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 adding no, no, value no. to what we are doing and you Thank know you. really showing support and being so warm and uh, one tiny question for you if you were to take away some learning from this session that we had today or an emotion or anything what would be that one thing that you would carry with you you know you 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 represent youth for me suju okay and uh, i can see that the youth of today they have a hunger they want to know things and they want to know things in a scientific a scientific way and if you, uh, as i said you are representing the youth right now and if you are the representative of youth this is what i'm taking away from normally as older people we sort of you know don't pay much attention to yeah. the younger generation but the younger generation of today i think is very much woke and very much into it and they want answers and they want answers in a scientific way that's what yeah. i'm taking away from you thank you so much well guys i hope you enjoyed this podcast guys and girls i got to be politically correct here so if you enjoyed it please like please watch please subscribe and please follow project u helmed by fuju thank you thank you very much have a great day